Ah, worked again. Isn't that wonderful? You get this computer stuff and everybody knows what's going on. Okay. We're gonna, we have started in our The Kingdom of Heaven series of messages. I have no idea how long this was going to last. I was going to keep it to maybe 12 weeks. But I don't think that's going to work. So we're going to talk about some kingdom fundamentals. These are important things for us to know. They are out of the book. I'm looking in the book, for, or in our scriptures, our Bible, for the answers, and not in other literature. I don't care what the commentaries say by either the Jews or the church. I want to find what the book says. Yahweh, open our eyes that we might see wonders from your word. Now in this series about the kingdom, you've got to understand that the Bible, we have a minion. Okay, the Bible is less about how to get into the kingdom of heaven after you die and more about how to live in it right now while you are here. That's important for us to know. It's a very important concept to realize. Okay, I want to clarify a couple of things. Terminology is one of those things that nails us pretty bad. The kingdom of God is the same thing as the reign of Elohim, depending on whose Bible you're reading it from. They're going to call it different words, but it's the same. The kingdom of heaven is the same as the reign of the heavens. The way of Yahweh, or the way of God, is the same thing. All of those six things are the same thing. It's the kingdom of God. We're go and go look those words up. Because you're going to find in certain Bibles or in certain books, for example, Matthew, you're going to see this same thing talked about one way, and in other books it's talked about another way. All right, the kingdom of heaven, the reign of the heavens, the kingdom of God, is actually a type of government. I chose to leave out all of the long, complicated man-made things about what a government is, but it is a type of a government. It will have a leader. Yahweh made a covenant with one man and his seed. Seed, singular word, zerah. That's the government. He's it. And this is his choices, you understand. We can decide to do anything we want, but he doesn't have to listen to us at all. He made the decision. Yahweh chose this one man, Avraham, and as far as I can see, just pretty much for this one reason. He believed in Yahweh, and Yahweh reckoned it to him for righteousness. That was it. Now, we don't know if he went off and asked a whole lot of other people. I mean, there's some... People are alluding to that in, in some of the commentaries. We don't know. But we do know that he asked this one man, and this one man said, yes, I will do it. We owe the kingdom of heaven to the faithfulness and obedience of Avraham. Without that obedience part, we would not have, well, we wouldn't have anything. We wouldn't have Yeshua, for, for example. And we live in the covenant between Yahweh and Avraham, and I forgot to write into this, and his seed. Anything outside of this covenant with Yahweh is not the kingdom of heaven. So it fits carefully and precisely in an order. Yahweh is an Elohim of order. The covenant promise passed from Isaac or from Abraham to his son, Isaac, not the other son, and then to Jacob, and then from Jacob to 12 sons. Now that's out of Scripture. It says Jacob had 12 sons. Now we just finished reading about Joseph's sons being adopted and so on, and then you got 
it still works out to 12, not one. Jacob had 12 sons, which became the 12 tribes of Israel. So when you say you're of the tribe of Issachar, you came out of the family of Issachar. Simple? The covenant promise, covenant, we go back to the covenant promise, is the kingdom of Elohim. It is the kingdom of heaven. It is the kingdom of God. It is the reign of the, of the heavenlies. It is the way of Yahweh. It is the covenant promise. And it carries several times where it is modified but never abolished. It's never changed. It's simply modified. We had a message on kingdom or on covenant way long time ago and probably have to do that again. The kingdom of heaven is the spiritual kingdom of Yahweh. It's a spiritual thing. The kingdom of heaven on earth is an extension of his reign in the heavens on earth. He does not physically reign here by sitting in a throne someplace here on earth. He has a really nice throne up there. So somebody has to sit down here. We'll have to get to that. But he, oh man, come on, don't do that, PT. Just wake up. All right, I've just done that. Did I just say that? We live in the covenant. Okay. We owe the kingdom of faithfulness and well-being. We did that. I'm not touching things anymore. The covenant, pro we did that. We did that? Yeah, we did that. See what happens when you, when you spin that little dialy thing on your mouse over here? It zips. It might zip 10 pages, and you can't do anything about it. All right, that's where we left off. <coughs> A temporary ruler of this kingdom was Joseph. He acted as a kind of a king because he was over Egypt. He took care of Egypt to make sure that they wouldn't starve. And Jacob and all, everybody else came down to Egypt, and he basically ruled over them. It was a temporary position and didn't really fill any kind of an issue in the, or anything in the covenant relationship Yahweh made. But he ruled with the, how do I say that? Okay, he ruled as though Yahweh was ruling through him. And we already, we've already read, we've already talked about what took place with Joseph. The permanent ruler of the earthly kingdom of Elohim was to be Judah and his seed. This is kind of important. So in Genesis, when there, there's this big thing right at the end of Genesis, chapter 49, you know, and there's a whole bunch of discussion about Jacob, i.e. Israel, blessing all of the sons. Well, one of them guys was, was uh, Judah, and he said, The scepter shall not turn aside from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh comes. And to him is the obedience of peoples. Now, there's hidden meaning in that. We, Pastor talked about it the other day or the other week, there's hidden meaning and there's a lawgiver. Lawgiver. Look up the word lawgiver. Find it in the scriptures. Hint, James. Shiloh is Mashiach. They understood that. It's another word, another name for the Messiah. The future king of Israel must come from the seed of of Judah, not one of the other guys. That's the way Yahweh said it was supposed to be. That's the end of the entire story. There is no further discussion. It will be somebody that's a Judahite. King David personified the true, honest king of Israel simply because he was a man after Yahweh's own heart. Why did Yahweh pick Abraham? 
because he believed him. Why did he pick David? He certainly wasn't some super guy. He was just man after Yahweh's heart. This was good stuff. It's something we should try to emulate, you know, sort of, a lot. Yahweh continues the covenant he made with Abraham in David. David reigned over 12 distinct tribes of people. He reigned over the seed of Israel. That was the third covenant Yahweh made with his people Israel. The second one was the Mosaic covenant. Covenant. The covenant is made specifically with David, assuring him. Now, this is the Davidic covenant. Really, there's not a whole lot except your seed will sit on the throne of Israel forever. It won't be transferred to somebody else. It certainly isn't going to get transferred to another place on the planet. Sorry, it don't work that way. It goes right to that place in Jerusalem. And they will continuously reign. Now, the last of David's descendants who will sit upon the throne of the kingdom will rule over a united Israel. The only way you can have restoration is you must restore it back to an original condition. In David's day, he ruled over 12 tribes. He passed that on to Solomon, his son, who ruled over 12 tribes until he got, whatever, he got carried away there. But he will, the, the future king will rule over both houses, Ephraim and Judah, and that will be restored by da, 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 Messiah himself. <coughs> David's son Solomon, uh, he just didn't keep God's law. That, that, was, that was it. He was trying for a while, but then he got off on other things. You know, he, well, how many wives was it? 700? you got to be kidding me. No way. Anyway, Solomon's sons, they decide, well, we're going to do this, and we're going to mess everything up, and they certainly did. Ten of the tribes split off from the, the whole of Israel, went up north, and they did their own thing. They threw out Yahweh's rules, Yahweh's commandments, and even the covenant. And they chose to do things that were not right. They are, or they became, Ephraim Israel or Israel. Those are the two, two terms you're going to find uh, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and then elsewhere in the, in the prophets. That's those guys, the ten guys. And then Ephraim, Israel, separated themselves from Yahweh, and he sent them into exile. And they lost everything, and they lost big time. They lost him. But there's a remnant within that. Now, they, he really knew what he was doing. you got to understand, Yahweh's smart. All right, now, he knew what he was doing. So by sending those, those bunches of people off and scattering them all over the world, they eventually turned all over the world into Ephraimites. There ain't no way you can tell whether in your blood you are not an Ephraimite, i.e. part of the ten tribes of Israel, or not. You cannot find out. And you're out there. And Yahweh is going to call to that little teeny thing in your DNA or your whatever, your genes or some kind of thing like that. He's calling to that now. The remaining two tribes and Levi became Judah Israel, and they more or less followed Yahweh's commands. Now, these guys think they're pretty smart and they're pretty cool, and we got it together. Well, now, why is it that Judah was sent into captivity for 70 years in a Babylon? They kind of didn't quite have it together. So neither tribe, neither group of people can say, we're it, man. No, it ain't going to work. 
The scepter of leadership was supposed to remain with Judah. The king of Israel was supposed to be of the tribe of Judah. Those are biblical facts. They are the way they are. And this is where we find it in that one little verse there in Genesis 49.10. We come back to the same thing. The scepter stays with the tribe of Judah. Judah failed again by nullifying the commands of Yahweh through their traditions. That's kind of paraphrasing what Yeshua said. The traditions of Judah became a Torah to them. Now the church is sitting there right now and saying, ah, we didn't do that. Yeah, they did exactly the same thing. The church nullified the Torah and replaced it with their traditions. Both groups messed things up. Yeshua came to earth to teach Torah correctly. Fact. This is what the Jews believed in his day. The people of Judah believed factually that the man was going to come, if he was going to be Messiah, he was going to come and teach Torah properly and correctly. That's why he can be called the Messiah. There's other things that he came to do, but that's one of them. He is of the tribe of Judah. He's qualified to be who he is because he is of the tribe of Judah. Yeshua receives the scepter of leadership from Yahweh. In Matthew 28, 18, he says, Yeshua came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. All have, in Matthew eleven seven twenty seven, 27, All have been handed over to me by my Father. And no one knows the Son except the Father. Nor does anyone know the Father except the Son, and he to whom the Son wishes to reveal him. Yeshua revealed to the people that he wanted to reveal who he was and who the Father is. We see this today. You aren't sitting here or there on YouTube if Yahweh didn't call you to do this. Now, some are sitting there and they're saying, well, I don't have to believe any of this. Well, okay. But guess what? That's going to stick with you. And it's not going to go away. It will stick with you for a long time. And someday you will wake up. Uh, hopefully. Anyway. In John 3.35, the Father loves the Son and has given all into his hand. In John 17, this is Yeshua's prayer. Read John 17. There's good things. This is where you, Yeshua says, I gave them your name. And if I'm not mistaken, it was seven times that he said that. But I can't remember right at the moment. As you, Yahweh, have given him authority over all flesh, that he should give everlasting life to all whom you have given him. Yahweh chose the people that would receive everlasting life because he already knew what was going to happen. Now, Rav Shaul agrees with what I've just said, that Yeshua holds the scepter. So when you say, well, Paul kind of did away with all of that stuff, I don't think so. Paul was an Orthodox Jew. Actually, he still is an Orthodox Jew, and his name wasn't Paul. It was Shaul. And he knew what was going on. In Ephesians 1.22, And he put all under his feet and gave him to be head over all. Again, Paul is saying this is the way things are. And in Hebrews 2, verse 8, essentially the same thing is being said. Therefore, Yeshua has a scepter of leadership. He possesses it. Yeshua is Yahweh's choice to be the leader 
over united Israel. Now, there's some real advantages to this. If we are believing Israel, we are believers in Yeshua, we are committed to being believers in Yeshua, understand? We are obedient to Yahweh's Torah because we are believers in Yeshua. Then when we pray in His name, in the King's name, you understand? When you pray, you are invoking that scepter of the King, the kingship of the king to your prayer. What does that do for us? We have a serious problem as believers. What happened to all of the healings? There shouldn't be anybody sick in here. What are we doing wrong? We should be speaking something and literally turn the hearts of everybody out there to him. We should say some words and, and they just fall over because we have that power of that kingship that exists now. This is why I keep saying the kingdom is now. It started, he, he brought it. We as believing Israel have authority through the Messiah Yeshua, through his kingship, through the throne he's sitting on today, over Hasatan, the adversary, also known as Satan. And we don't even use that power. I don't think we know how. I think sometimes we, we think we're supposed to be in some kind of trance or something or another, or, or somehow our, our, we're supposed to do some great things when I don't see anybody doing that. They were all peaceable about things. They didn't come and have bands and, and parades whenever they did something. They just spoke it. Well, Yeshua healed a bunch of guys. I mean, look at it in the book. He heals a bunch of guys, and he just basically says, you're healed. No band, no parade. No waving flags or stuff like that. I'm beginning to wonder, and I really have for a long time, I bet he did a whole lot of this that never made it into the book. Why? He is the king of Israel. And we don't accept it. We let it, we kind of let it go. We don't, we don't grab hold of that power. I mean, Rick and I have been in, in combat zone. We know power. We know weaponry. I was an artilleryman. You had authority. And I had authority. Under your commander. Why aren't we doing it today? Not just us. Why aren't you doing it up there, YouTube? What are we doing? Our faith is weak. I don't know if it's that. Some of us have faith you could... You, you really nuclear grade faith but there's something wrong we're not pulling that out is it strife between each one, each person is it is it some of the things that we may be involved in secretly or openly are all these things we're, we're looking for different things and it may be all we have to do is just sit down and say i believe in yeshua he's my king we sing it he's my king And I want to exercise that authority. And I won't do it inappropriately. We have to be careful with the, our anger towards other people. Now, I'm, of course, I never have anger toward other people. <laughs> not, even, not even close. Yeah, right. I don't, uh, not even close. But we have authority over the Satan. We have, no, we have no excuse for allowing the things that are happening to us personally. Now, trying to convince one of our family members and then saying, Oh, Jesus, please come down here and fix my daughter. No, no, there's another thing going on there. But you can pray against Satan's influence. 
and there's people in here that are knowing that, and Margaret and I are two of them that know it. We can pray against that, that, that thing. All right. Shalom.